Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and today I have the pleasure of reacquainting myself with Samantha Petrie Quillen, who we had a great conversation. I forget how long ago. It could it could have it could have been a week, it could have been a year, it could have been a decade. Sometime in the last six to twelve months or so, we chatted. I had such a great time. I reached out to her recently to have her back on just, just to talk about the year that's passed, the year to come, everything in between. So let me reacquaint you with Samantha, and then we'll just have a conversation like we do. Samantha has coached clients at all levels, from CEOs to interns, and traveled extensively to teach people how to find career clarity, take their seat at the table, and make a real impact in the spaces they occupy. With well over 15 years of HR experience in the corporate and the startup worlds, she understands that success is the intersection of opportunity and experience. Samantha, it is a pleasure to have you back on. I know we had a brief guest appearance from your dog earlier, which is always welcome, but I'm glad to be able to talk with just you <laughs> today. Thank you. I think it'll just be as for the duration of our conversation, but yeah, he's a, he's a, a very present force in our house. I'm a, I, I'm an animal person, three cats currently, no dogs, but like still every time I see a dog, I just, I do the thing like that sappy, emotional people do where I'm just like, oh. It's like immediately like the best thing that's happened to me in my entire life. I just see a dog in the wild or whatever. So it's like, it, like the moment I saw the dog in the frame, when we first got into the zoom, I like, I, my heart lifted. I, I, I can only be who I am. So at this point I embrace it. <laughs> no, he's great. We love him. His name is Shakespeare. He's a five-year-old shih tzu. He oh, lets us, he lets us pay for this lovely house that he lives in and he lets <laughs> us feed him and love him and do all of the things. And he just, he dictates what, what we do. So we love it. He's so generous. So kind and loving. So, kind. so let's talk about, I, these have been like a year in review see, a conversation series. And oh. let's, let's, this time, let's start by looking forward. What are you, we're recording this in like mid-November. So obviously we're getting dangerously close to the quote unquote holiday season. People, I'm right. seeing decorations left and right and whatnot. What are you most looking forward to, most excited about in the year to come? So I definitely think we went Halloween, Christmas, I think Thanksgiving, which is actually my holiday, like we skipped over, but yeah, so I think we went, we definitely went Halloween, Christmas, but I am really looking forward to, I'm a career coach. And so I think every year for the last three years, we've seen some real shifts in the world of work. We saw the great resignation. We saw quiet quitting. We saw, I think now we've seen sort of economic downturns and major layoffs. And so I think the next step is really this real, I think, moment. And most recently, we've seen these labor unions, right? Whether it's SAG mm -hmm. or the Writers um, Guild or, or others, we've seen these real moments of like labor coming, coming to, to reckon with employers. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we're going to continue to see. Maybe not necessarily on the labor union side, but just labor in general, just workers really requiring a different understanding of the world of work. And I think that's going to be particularly well seen in what employees are requiring in terms of learning and development, in terms of um, growth, in terms of really being able to leverage their professional experiences to the goals that they have. And so mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a real opportunity of a very different dynamic that mm -hmm. is very different. I've always said that the skills that got you there are not the skills that'll get you there. Mm -hmm. The skills that, and they aren't, they're different, right? And the skills that, that get you here will not get you there. And, and I think employees are now really owning that in a different way and are really understanding that they can no longer be in the trunk or the back seat of their careers and they, that they need to get in the driver's seat and that there can be an opportunity for partnership with their employers mm -hmm. on how they do that and how they do that in a more collaborative way than the sort of, I need to do it on my own to get this other mm -hmm. job. It's really, hey, how can I grow and change and leverage my skills to be different? That's such a good point. And I really, I'm glad that you kept it, you opened it up in a very dynamic way because it's obviously the, a lot of the labor union actions, a lot of the strikes and whatnot have gotten a lot of the headlines, which is great. 
And I think it's rather than the story itself, it's indicative of the real story and that there's just more people are, they're more interested less in taking control and they're more interested in, I, I'm glad, I'm so glad you said this, the collaboration aspect where it's like our standards for what we're accepting in personal and professional development, they're going up and that's a good thing for everybody. Let's figure out how we work this together. And if there's conflict or if there's a lack of desire on an employer's part to engage in that way, then there are actions that can be taken. But there's also an invitation to collaboration that is very powerful right now. And it's really, if you I have been having a lot of conversations, even more so than usual about alignment, I feel like alignment comes up with almost every coach. And that's, of course, makes total sense. But there's more of a desire to find an employer kind of as a partner that you're in alignment with, where it's, I would like to serve your goals. I would like you to serve mine. Our goals intertwine together and we grow and go forward together. And I feel like that awareness, that commitment is rising amongst the labor pool. And I feel like a, an acceptance of that is, it's going to be great for everybody. I know I'm, I'm doing the rose colored glasses optimist view because obviously there's butt heads, butt here and there, but it just seems like a long overdue rebalancing and, and a better way to move forward. Yeah, I think that what people have begun to understand is there is this inextricably linked codependency that mm -hmm. we have created, capitalism has created for workers and for employers, right? This yeah. is not just, a, and I think for a long time, that equation looks like I'm the employer, I have all of the power, you're the employee, and you have no say. And I think for a host of societal and cultural reasons, that is shifting. And I think we can credit that to the Gen Zers, maybe even some of the younger millennials who are just like, no, that's not, we're not going to do that. And really their motivators became different. I think in generations past, as the child of a boomer and an exer herself, Money used to be king. It was who, it was pay, it was pay rate. It was all about comp. Mm -hmm. And I think so many have started to get to the point now. And I think, again, the implications of inflation where numbers that we used to be really impressed by are like, I live in New York <laughs> City. And so we're like, oh, that's minimal, you know, $100,000, that's minimum wage. And it's not, there are many people who survive every day on minimum wage and on um, much less than $100,000. But I think people began to see how not substantial these numbers were. So they want, they it moved to something else. And I think that is really shifting the equation so that it is much more, hey, you need me as much as I need you. This is where I mean about that symbiotic co-creation collaborative um, partnership, right? You need, and em employers need employees to, treat their customers, innovate on their products to really, Ooh. they need all of those things and they cannot be who they are without their workforce. And their mm -hmm. workforce cannot leverage the resources and the equity and the, and the venture capital to do those things. And so I think that in 2024, we're going to see a lot of what I call, in, what the market calls entrepreneurship, which mm. are organizations saying, hey, you have an entrepreneurial inclination. Do that entrepreneurial thing in partnership with us. We'll figure out the revenue profit share. We'll put up your money, those kinds of things. And so it really, I think, is going to start to look um, much more symbiotic and much more mm -hmm. partnership than this sort of us versus them kind of battle we've pitted people against for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's this... And obviously we could this we, we can slice this up for hours and hours, but there's this sort of not even false sort of premise that's out there where it's it's a zero sum game. The pie is the pie, it'll always be the pie, it has always been the pie. That's it. It's the same thing. The pie means the same thing. The, the amount of slices in the pie means the same. It always is. You guys gotta divide it up as best you can, and that's it. And what we realized is that. Just like kind of how you were talking about, like your money not really going as far as it used to for lots of very natural reasons, the way like an economy develops where it's a hundred grand. You're just like, oh, I can go ahead and get ready to put a down payment on a house. Whereas nowadays you can maybe get a dozen eggs once a week and feel good. <laughs> it's, it's gotten a little bit different, but those are because the our perception of and the value of those numbers changes. We've had to change how we value our work, yeah. how we value our work and how employers value our work. 
Yeah. And I feel like and I'm basically just like a long way around agreeing with you. I find it so fascinating how we are arriving at something much more collaborative. And I do love that term in internship, inter entrepreneurship, Inter however you entrepreneurship. <laughs> intrapreneurship that's good that's good i'm gonna have to make sure i add that to my vocabulary because it feels like a great word to capture exactly where we're going where it's empowered and active people determining what success looks like for them in collaboration with their employer to everyone's benefit and that's the, yeah that's again that's the hope that certainly seems like where we're going <laughs> maybe well, we're being dragged to be. screaming <laughs> well, I think it has to be where we're going. And yeah. it's something to say to my clients. I think we know, and I, I said this last year when you and I were chatting, my two biggest things, two of my biggest points have always been, the game isn't chess or checkers. The game is poker, right? The game <laughs> isn't even growing up as a kid, people were always like, oh, stop playing checkers and start playing chess. And it's, but that, that's not the game either. Because because chess assumes exactly what's on the board and you are watching the moves of your opponent and you know what your opponent can and cannot do. And poker isn't, that isn't the game. Poker is about convincing you of what I'm holding. It's mm -hmm. not even that I'm holding. It's literally convincing you by the way I play, by the way I strategically over the course of the game. It's not even hand to hand. It's over the course of how long we've been playing that you are picking up on what I'm giving you as my cues, my nods, mm -hmm. my tells, and, and, and an interpreting from there. And it's what I'm convincing you of. And I think when people realize that we, we are playing poker, that folks started to just convince themselves of something else. And folks decided, like, why not try something else? People try collaboration, right? The number of spaces that I see that are colleagues teaching colleagues, right? The number of places where I see job shares or job shadows or cross training and those kinds of things where people are really saying, hey, wait, I don't have to gatekeep this hmm. role. I don't have to gatekeep this information. It behooves me to share. And I think that when folks started saying, whether that was salary transparency or just sharing how they got to their roles or sharing resources and information, people began to understand like, oh, wait, this doesn't have to be a zero sum game. This really can be win. And I think when folks realize, oh, wait, why are we set up like this? We don't have to be set up like this. It's not sales versus customer success. It's I can't be successful without you and you can't be successful without me. And so I think when we started to move in those kinds of and understand how we were really all interdependent on one another, folks began to understand. So we saw different things. You saw the rise of community gardens. You see the rise of collective housing situations where you have groups of friends or groups of people buying a bigger, one big building and everybody takes their small share. And <laughs> I think we've also gotten out of this, I've got to own the whole thing. Um, and I think we saw, we see that with even things like stocks, right? Like you can now buy, I think, I think I forget who it is, but somebody has these like sliver opportunities now, right? So you can buy a piece of a whole thing. And I think people began to realize I don't necessarily need that, right? I need a piece of that, but I don't necessarily need the whole thing. And how can we pool resources? How can we come together? And how can we all execute from that perspective? I, I really like that. And the analogy, the, the, as you kept talking, the analogy of poker keeps yielding more insights so I'm thinking about how there are like with, with poker, with certain games, you have to have a certain amount of money to play it. There's an ante or there's, there are blinds or whatever happens to be. And also to play the game right, you just have to have a certain amount of capital or a certain amount of influence or a certain amount of value to be at certain tables. There are tables that are pretty much come one, come all, and you can, everybody can play. It's just the way that it works. But there are players where you have to have, or games where you have to have a certain amount to be able to play. And that's where that collect collective action really comes in handy, where if you get people realizing that we all want the same thing and we all understand how to get it. We just need to get enough together to have a seat at that table, to get to that place, to have enough to be able to make the moves we need to make. And then you have these, all these different creative implementations of that kind of collective action. It's just, it's downright inspiring, really. I'll go a step further, right? And being a new poker player myself, sometimes you also get invited into the table right? So you get anteed up four. 
And yeah. I think that's really indicative of what sponsorship and mentorship in corporate was is supposed to be, right? Yeah. Really having those door openers, those folks that say, hey, this is a room you need to be in. Come, come be my guest in the room. Come play with me. Come, I, I vouch for, I vouch for this person. This person needs to be here. And I think that collectively, especially for my population of female, of women and BIPOC professionals, that's so empowering and so necessary to know mm -hmm. that you were invited into the room and you were, you, there's somebody opened the door, held the door open for you. That is a big moment. And I think that is the, the decline of the, what we all remember, I will call it the old boys networks, right? Where, <laughs> you know. And folks yeah. were hoping, holding the doors open for specific types of people. And mm -hmm. I think as we start to get why I say claim your seat at the table, when right. folks start to claim their seats at the table, they start to hold a door open and they start to invite folks in and call folks in and really make sure. I love the Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote when someone asked her how many just how many female justices will be enough. And she said nine. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's it, it is that shift, right? But this idea that, you know what? This whole room can look different. And I think we're watching it look so dramatically different in rapid succession. It really does. And again, this is about, it feels like both of us have our optimism hats on. Because, but there is so much to be optimistic about. And I understand why there are, there are still plenty of obstacles. Oh. <laughs> in, in, including the old boys network still cl like clinging for dear life to its, its false feelings of importance and power. But I just, I really love that idea of extending the poker metaphor of staking someone where it's just, I see something in you that is valuable. You have talent, you have drive, you have will, you have commitment, you have whatever it is, whatever I think it takes. And you're someone who's been in, in certain rooms before. And you're like, you know what? You need to get in here. Because there's, you have a lot to give and you have a lot to learn. I'm going to stake you. And so I'll give you a, give you whatever you need to sit at those tables just to get a seat there to first. And right. with the faith and the trust, it's like, I already know you're going to prove yourself worthy of this table. I already know it. I can see it. You just need that door opened for you. You just need that bankroll to sit down at that seat. And then you're going to go ahead and you're going to fly with it. And I just... I love that, again, that's happening more and more, a recognition of get in, get that seat, get at that table, make sure you leave the door open for right, the, the right people behind you, make sure you're looking behind and around you for the people that you can help and serve as you were helped and served. It's really that rising tide raises all boats thing. It, it's, it's pretty simple and it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so great. And I think nail professionals understand they need that sponsorship. So I yeah. think there was a moment where folks were letting sponsors come to them. And mm. I think now we have switched sponsorship and advocacy into mm. going and looking for that, looking for folks that will stake us and yeah. saying, I want to be staked. And this is why I'm the right person for you to stake. And this is why I'm the right person for this. And I think that is also a different particularly for women and particularly for BIPOC professionals, that's a different way of promoting ourselves to really get and say, hey, look, I this is what I can do. And I think that is where some of that symbiotic, again, I keep calling it symbiotic codependency happens. Mm -hmm. right? We need each other. You need me to be creative and to bring the, I jokingly say, I will always stay around young people and, and painfully, you read part of my bio, um, but I've been in this business more years than I want to admit. And I, I know there's so, I, TikToks while occasionally I'm on the app, I, I is not my strong suit, but my, my younger colleagues, they bring such a wealth of energy and knowledge and information to me. And there's so much, hey, have you done this? We need to do that. And their enthusiasm <laughs> and you feed off of that and you need that pulse on the ground, especially as you mm -hmm. rise in leadership. Sometimes the 747 can freely forget what it's like to be a crop duster, right? They were only down there for, for moments on, on takeoff. And so they really need that feedback, that understanding of that person who's a little closer to the ground who can say, hey, there's a storm coming, right? Hmm. And they're going to be able to send that back down as well. So there's this real sort of um, two-way flow 
of information and knowledge and wisdom and understanding that really can start to happen when you make sure as a leader that you are surrounded by that kind of those kinds of sparks and mm-hmm. folks who, who are getting and you're sharing with them your institutional knowledge as they're sharing with you what's going on a little closer to the ground. But it's also really necessary for the best evolution of what I, like we said, of our products, of the way we serve our clients, and of the way we move forward. Is It's really important that we are all there focused on, hey, wait, we can do this even better. I think, I, and I forget, and I can see is, I want to call it, I'm going to mess up his name's, But I think his name is James Alcher. But he talks about in his book, this idea of ideas. So he's this great serial entrepreneur who like sold a business for millions, lost it all, then created Mm -hmm. another business and all the things. And he talks about how the way that we get create, that we get our minds working, right? Or that we write down 10 ideas a day. And then, and he was well known for writing them on waitress order pack. That was his claim to fame. Okay. And and if I'm messing up his name, I apologize. No one come for me in the comments. I think it's I think um, it's Altisher or something like that. I think there's like something th- like that. Yeah. Something like uh-huh. that. You're close. I know you're close because it rings a big bell for me, but I don't want to stop and Google because we're having a great conversation. <laughs> he talks about how your best idea is actually this sort of culmination of ideas. So it's probably mm. not one of the ideas you wrote on your list on the 14th of October six years ago. It's gonna be. What you wrote there is probably might be the launch pad, but you're going to add and you're going to take a little piece of this and you're going to take a little piece of that and you're going to take this other thing you saw done over here and you're going to start to put together and Mm -hmm. really piece together the right solution. And I love that because that's really it. It, Mm -hmm. Your best ideas are not like I woke up and I came up with the one thing. It's going to be all of the track records of failed attempts that you or colleagues or other people in the market have tried and that have not succeeded and you looking through that and saying, okay, why did that fail? Oh, okay. So if we add this to the thing we're doing, that'll be successful. If we Mm -hmm. add that to the thing we're doing. (laughs) And that's really how folks are going to succeed. And I think people are understanding that now. And they're really understanding why those relationships require a little bit from you and a little bit from me and a little bit from Mm -hmm something else and that one extra thought and that's really what it's going to look like and I think folks understand that now right there's no one big idea guy it is really like a big team event right there's no one thing that people are like yep that's it just roll it out the way she described it it's (laughs) all of us iterating on it it's funny it's funny how we work because we're always looking it feels like we're always trying to create heroes no matter how much we have to ignore all the people who helped that person get to where they are or all the people that person represents, you think about, and I, I don't want to go down, down the rabbit hole because I feel like I could talk, I could, we could do this all day and it's already been like a half an hour that we've been talking, but I often think about that, the cult of personality around Steve Jobs and how b- fairly big of a deal he was and how talented he was in certain aspects, but he didn't invent the touchscreen. <laughs> like the engineers behind that, there's so much that went into just that one little particular revolution, that one little smartphone revolution. And right. it's something I think it's a good le- it's a good thing to think about for all of us because we have to realize that we are, even as we're writing down our ideas on cocktail napkins or or order pads, we are every every little failure of connection, every little bit of misalignment, all of that gives us the the pieces, the raw material to build our next success in collaboration with everybody that we're succeeding and failing with and around. It's all of us moving forward together. It's just, yeah, it's a great thing to remember too. It's we don't have to, we don't have to have this command and control, great hero myth in our heads. (laughs) But you don't really find it interesting. And I think if you, if you read his book and I think if you really study him, he never really, I think we've given him a bad rap, but he never really fell into the cult of personality trap mm-hmm. that we were trying to trap him in yeah, we he did was that always <laughs> like hey surround yourself with the folks that are gonna now he did i think drive really hard and i think he mm-hmm. had really high expectations for the people who were around him yeah. and i'm not saying he was an easy person to be around necessarily but i do think he was always about 
that surrounding that circle. And one Mm -hmm. of the things I keep saying to clients, that's really a big part of my practice is who you surround yourself with. I learned that the hard way and easy way, but hard way too. As an entrepreneur, (laughs) who you surround yourself with is so key. There is something to be said for rising to the level of the expectations that others have of you. And mm-hmm. when you surround yourself with the brightest and greatest thinkers, you really, he did it, I think, to become and to be the best thinker. But there's something, like you said, there's something to be said for being in that room and knowing that it wasn't just your idea and being mm-hmm. like, okay, I have to come up with an be- even better idea tomorrow. And <laughs> I think that what we all have to also remember is it's not even the, the idea, it's really the execution. And I think we, there's been a long history of us wanting to credit the idea person, right? Who has the mm-hmm. patent? Who has, <laughs> the, who has the, who's, who cre- designed it or what have you. But the reality is it's like our iPhones are great and God love them. Like I yeah. don't know what, you know, mine should be surgically implanted in my hand. However, the question isn't really what we have is what we do with it when we have it. If you're sitting there mm-hmm. playing Candy Crush all day, right? That's not as that's not going to get <laughs> you to the same place. Whereas if you are using and leveraging the machine that it is to do the hard stuff. And a great we we unfortunately went to a funeral the other day, and mm-hmm. it was so great. Her father was talking about we always emphasize the dates, right? We, the, the date that we were born and the date that we died. And he was like, those two dates are the most inconsequential dates in life. Like Mm -hmm. the dates that are important are all captured in the dash. Mm -hmm. And so what are you doing with your dash? And I think that Mm -hmm. is what has, has really, really been so awe inspiring and an awakening for me in 2023 but it really is what are we doing with our dash like we are spending loads of hours at work right but what's the impact are you happy are you fulfilled are you are you doing stuff you like after work right even if you're letting work finance your other things (laughs) are you in hobbies that you really are like oh my god this is what i want to be doing or are you just going to bed and waking up and trapped in groundhogs with I really love that. What are you doing with your dash? That's that. Honestly, I think that's going to end up like on the whiteboard. That's going to end up on a sticky note. because That's just that. That's perfect. And also now I'm be, I feel like I've been an irresponsible host because I've just been like getting sucked into everything that you're saying. And I'm like, my goodness, we've already been talking for like almost three quarters of an hour. So before I let you go, thank you for not just being here today with me, but just for doing what you do and being who you are. It's like, I'm, I definitely, I feel my, my, my cup is very full right now in a very positive way. So I feel very, I'm usually a pretty optimistic person, but I feel like ready to take on the world or or ready to join hands with the world, so to speak, that feeling. So thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. And where, if anybody wants any part of this, they want to just chat with you, if they want to get to know anything about you, if they want to connect professionally, everything in between, where can they, where can people best do that? Sure. So LinkedIn is always a great option. Uh, It's Samantha Petrie Cullen and I'm there. Our company, Creating Miss Jones, is there as well. Um, and our website, www.creatingmissjones.com is a great place to either to book a call or to watch more videos or sign up for our new our newsletter, sign up for our mailing list, all of the things. I am um, in mid-December hosting a workshop, it will be free. And so if this has dropped in terms of publication by then, I will, I will do, folks can go to the website, can register there. And if it has not dropped by then, and you are hearing this, and it is after mid-December, you, I will run a special workshop. So if you, again, go back to our website, And make sure that you check it out. I will run it again so that we can make sure that anyone that's listening to this can have an opportunity. And if you say that you heard, if you go to our website and you fill out a contact form and you list this podcast as your referral source, we will make sure that we give you a great little bundle of goodies as well. And yes, I'm Samantha at creatingmissjones.com is my email address. And 
folks can email me directly and reference this as well. And happy to engage and understand and really chat with your listeners always. I really want to just be about service. I think mm -hmm. why I, I said this before when I was here last year, I got into this business because I wanted to serve folks. I wanted to share this interesting point of view with the world. I wanted other folks to be able to figure out how they shared their interesting points of view and really wanted to make sure that we were all in a space where we were adding the biggest part of it. Yes, I help people gain clarity. And yes, I help people get to leadership tables and all of that. But it's the impact, right? That's what all of us are doing this for. And so um, really, like you said, I want to make that 1% shift um, on a daily basis and, and have that kind of impact for folks and want to be that supportive um, voice for, for folks wherever I can. So yeah, that's how they can get me. And definitely want to make sure that we engage and the work goes on <laughs> joyfully. <laughs> it's it's good work. It really is. And that's that's one of the things I find to be one of the things I love about talking with coaches is that there there are so many distinct, unique approaches where they're like a collection of experiences and skills and inclinations and and just upbringings that lead someone to try to serve a particular community in a particular way. And there are certain values that really, in, in my experience, unite every single good coach I've ever spoken to. And one of them is that desire to serve. I, I want to serve. I want to have an impact and help others have the impact they want to have in their communities, in their in themselves, in their families, wherever they happen to be living, working, breathing, acting. And so it's completely unsurprising and nevertheless terribly delightful to have you express that just so beautifully right there. So that's, oh, this you. is me blowing smoke up your butt again. Thank Giving you the gratitude again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that people that I jokingly say this to folks, I love being an entrepreneur. I love being a coach. I love both of those roles and both of those things. However, yeah, I think if it's not service focused though, it's so easy to quit, right? It's yeah. so easy to pull your, you've been in this space and talk to enough coaches. If it's just about the money, we all know a broke day. So it's kind of, <laughs> that's your motivation. There's so many days where you just like pull the covers over my head and I'm staying in the bed. And so I, I really feel like the service is what keeps getting us out of bed and what really makes us dust ourselves off because we've all failed. And and some of us failed big, some of us have fallen um, far. And so I think that it's that service that sort of keeps motivating you to say, hey, let me get up. Let me dust myself off. Like somebody needs to hear this really funny anecdote that I'm going to say about some story my grandmother told me when I was seven. And so let me go out and not let that man, that BIPAC um, professional or that woman not hear that story. And like you said, when we are in service, right, these conversations feel really good. And we do, we do, we get the, the little energy boost we needed to go and be like, I want to go lock hands with the world. I want to go fix stuff. I want to go I want to go talk to other optimistic people. So yeah, that's really, and I think like you said, every good coach I've ever met, whether we do the same things or different things are about service. And yeah, I think it's so important. That's awesome. I could do this all day. This is great, but I gotta let you go. Yeah. Samantha, thank you so much for sharing some time with so me welcome. today. Happy to come oh. back anytime. Thank you for the invitation. So yeah. appreciate it. And we will chat soon. And to the audience, you know what to do next. If you want some of this, you want to have these kinds of conversations, you want to be doing this kind of stuff in the world. So take action, reach out. There'll be links in the show notes to everything. Samantha's name will be spelled correctly. You know where to find her on LinkedIn, on her website. Do what you do best. <laughs> Listen, take action, and we'll talk to you again very soon.